That's what I like about things that are downloadable. You can have an idea on a Friday evening and you can get it implemented by Monday morning without having to deal with other people. Um, all right. Um, let's talk about user registration data models. Um, Mike here has used so many advanced tools to develop his data models that he can't show them to us. Which one do you want to see, Philip? <laughs> <laughs> That's, the table, the group's table. <laughs> That's why I like having them all in one file, uh -huh. and then uh, that you can write an Emacs with copious comments, and then feed it um, to uh, feed it to SQL, which is not the corporate way. I actually once talked to this woman at HP. We were working with a group at Hewlett Packard in Corvallis, Oregon, and she said, "This data model. Uh, I'm now going to maintain the data model, and the way you've done it is not adequate. It's not documented adequately." I said, what do you mean? It's got comments all over the place. And she said, well, you just can't do data models that way. You have to use Oracle Designer, I think it's called, Oracle Designer 2000. So we said, well, you know, we don't use tools like that because our servers are co-located, and uh, those are desktop PC tools, so we don't have a lot of Windows machines. And even if we did, we wouldn't want to open up um, access directly into the Oracle database from outside of uh, Exodus or from outside of the physical machine itself. So in other words, it's a terrible security hole to have the machine even accessible, to have those Oracle ports accessible and let people uh, outside make a connection direct to the database. So that's why we don't use Oracle Designer 2000, because it relies on a connection to the database directly. Whereas if you're using Emacs on the server, you can type whatever you want. All you have is an encrypted X Windows session. So um, she said, yeah, we're not going to take that security risk either. So what I'm going to do is whenever I want to add a column to the table, what I'm going to do is um, export the database on the production machine or the development server that's at Exodus. I'm going to SCP it over the public internet to a server here inside the HP firewall. Then I'm going to connect to that using Oracle Designer make my changes using the graphical user interface, and then there's a mode in which you can write out you know, some SQL alter table statements and so forth to uh, implement those changes. And then I'm going to go back to the public, uh, to the co-located server and apply those changes. So we said, well, you know, this is supposed to be a database of PDF files for production, you know, for prepress. So, you know, the average row contains a 20 megabyte PDF in uh, a binary or I guess PDF could be in a character large object, C lob. So uh, anyway, so she was talking about copying a terabyte database over the public internet. In fact, they'd order you know racks and racks of disk drives uh, just in order to make uh, alter table add one column because uh, she didn't want to use uh, something like Emacs and typing. So in that tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I, see, I actually like this less than the typed one because if you just type it in a file, you have some incentive to type comments. So what what is this? The user table is on the left hand side. The group table is on the right hand side. This is the, the group the user definition. The user definition. There's another table, but actually. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, it's too bad we can't bump up the font sizes here much. Um, all right, what do you guys, uh, can you guys read that? So what do you think of this data model? Okay, why don't you go, why don't you go through it? Um, all right, so this is the, the basic user definition table. It has, it has a user ID field, which is the primary key, which is what that little graphical symbol means. Are you using Oracle or uh, SQL Server? Server. So this is like a, a described output. Uh, I'll nod and say yes, but I don't know what that means. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, username, bar card, password, first name, last name, organization, address, um, some sort of kind of generic, vaguely internationalized um, city-state postal code. Um, well, actually, we can get country in here. We don't have that. Um, email. Opt out if they've chosen to um, 
not get email from us, registration date, last visit date, and one bit to mark if the user's been excluded, sort of generically. Uh, and then the groups are defined, uh, group ID, same thing, a primary key that's unique. Uh, group type, uh, which... So permission oriented, you know, what, whether this is an admin person or a, or a regular a member of the committee uh, who does the document editing or a public member of the public. Yeah. And then short name, pretty name. Short name direct to, so... So how, how do you put somebody in a group? Uh, there's... <coughs> we, what we have uh, for now is a... Um, so there's just a two-column table, user ID, group ID. And do you have any indices defined separately? Um, there are actually, I don't think, no, we didn't turn indices on in here, but we could. Okay. So each person is just in one group? Can we no, go back no, to... No, you can have multiple. You can have... As well, let's, 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 let's go back to the user's table first, if you guys will. Okay. Can you give a one minute thing oh, you have about what my project is? Yeah, is that both uh, um, This is a, a project, um, uh, a group out in Quincy called the National Fire Protection Association, who's a, a client that I've done work for, you know, the company I worked for before. Um, and they write fire codes, uh, they're not for profit, that are, these codes are adopted by something like 38 states in the country as, as the fire law. Um, and they, the codes are written by professionals who volunteer. It's a status thing that you work, that your name is on this code. Uh, and the way they work on these codes right now is they take all the people, they fly them to a hotel somewhere, and they have them work on the code about every three years, and then they uh, produce a new version of it. And they need a system whereby they can begin to do some of that stuff online to avoid some of that. So it's a community for those people, and then they also take public comments. So if you're a member of the public who has some reason to know about these fire codes, you can come in, make a comment about specific things, interact with the committee members about it. That's so in this case, the groups would be the different codes. The, diff the, yeah. the different committees. Yeah, yeah, because committees, each, there are committees who are responsible for specific codes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so this just proves the uh, rule that uh, every website needs a user grouping mechanism, that there is always some uh, subgrouping thing that's useful. Uh, there, sorry. Yeah, there, there, are, there are 350 codes, and I don't know how many groups that was. Probably about 150 groups, something like that. All right, so let's let's sh let's talk about this uh, user ID for a second. I believe, although I'm not an expert on this uh, GUI. Uh, but I know for a fact that a SQL Server has an auto sequence generator mm -hmm. on uh, integer primary key columns. Yes, that's about it. So it looks like this has been turned on. Identity yes means this is the primary key? Uh, it means that it's a, it's a role. Uh, uh, it's unique and it will roll up. Okay, and identity seed I guess means it starts at one, and identity increment presumably means that each successive user who's added to the table gets uh, one plus the old user ID. So that gets you out of the, um, you know, Oracle deals with this using sequences, which are a little more flexible. Um, I don't believe SQL Server has any kind of sequence mechanism. So if you were, to, if you wanted um, transactionally to generate um, a, uh, like for session ID, it's very convenient in Oracle actually to generate, say, session IDs uh, to use the sequences. In SQL Server, you'd have to go and, you know, insert bogus rows in a table and then delete them or something to get a series of unique IDs out of the database. Um, so this is, you know, it's better and it's worse. It's more convenient. Uh, I think it's actually not as nice as that corresponding Oracle feature because it's not as flexible. Um, Where do you say whether a thing that we know has to be? Um, if, if, if any of these were checked, it would allow them to be null. They all have, all these strings have default values. Um, it's the difference between a null value and an empty string, okay. and they all have defaults of. Uh, it's hard to see, but they all have defaults of empty string, so you don't have to specify it. But you don't want it to be null because if it's null, then you have you to deal with different operations yeah, and things <clears throat> that pull out of it and stuff like that. That's an interesting thing. See, Oracle actually, so a SQL purist wouldn't like this, because you want to be able to distinguish between the user refuse to answer the question, which would be, you know, empty string, submitted a form with the empty string, perhaps, and the user was never asked the question. 
which would be null. So a SQL purist really always wants to see that three-valued logic impl implied, employed, where you have you know, empty string being a false and uh, some value in there being a true, and then null being the third value that's always there. Yeah. So can you, why don't you guys talk a bit about um, the fact that there's, there's a username and there's an email address. What do you guys think about that, pluses and minuses? Anybody want to say usernames are great? Um, it depends what kind of community you, you, you want. Um, in some, you mentioned non threatening at the example that you encouraged what you called people who had reasonable email addresses. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I, I guess I know what it means. It's kind of like John but West that company, um, right. as opposed to you know, um, you know space name or space name eight thirty eight. Right. Um, but I guess that's a question of what kind of community you want to encourage. In this case, it seems to say you want first name, dot, last name, type, professional name. Or the, the advantage of username is if you want some sense, sort of anonymity, you don't want mm -hmm. to be bombarded by emails. The disadvantage is that you have to remember two things now. There's two things you have to keep track of. So it depends. Yeah, so why is that a problem for a publisher? As a publisher, why is it a problem for you that your user now has to remember username and... Uh, yeah, because they're going to forget their username and then they're going to email you or call your ass at home. Um, so that's one reason on photo.net I would never consider doing username <coughs> just because I, you know, it's very, <laughs> if a person has forgotten his or her email address, um, you know, they need help beyond uh, <laughs> what they're going to get from the photo.net administrator. Um, but, you know, it is pretty easy. Like, I use PhilG. PhilG a lot of the time as my username on sites because PhilG is usually taken. Uh, sometimes I use pgreenspun, and it becomes this nightmare. And, yeah, so if you're running uh, planetout.com, uh, then you need to support that kind of anonymity. Um, now, notice that just because you use the email address as the login token, if you will, doesn't mean that you have to publish it. So on photo.net, we publish first name, last name everywhere uh, on the public pages, and only if you're logged in do you get to see somebody's email address. So that addresses the issue of spam to some extent. So why did you guys choose um, to... Well, this is um, also based off... Uh, I guess I should briefly show... There's... Um, there's uh, the, NF the NFPA has a... Um, uh, these codes are all online, um, and all these committee members have access to these codes, and they already have login names and passwords here. So you're going to need to import that from the legacy system. Yeah, and they're used to it. So they're used to logging into this system that way. So for them, okay. for, for the end user, for the public who comes in, it might be, oh, that's cute, it might, it might be more interesting to have them. Okay. Just use their email. But. So that's something to consider. Um, all right, let's go to uh, password. Okay, why not? Um, well, if in ter are you saying encrypting in terms of um, putting it in so you can never get it back, or I'm talking about putting it through a, a one-way function, one -way like a Unix um, Etsy password file. If you look at that, that's been put through <coughs> a function where it's quick and easy to take the string and check it and then compare it, but you can't reverse the process unless you use a dictionary. This way we can email the user the password if they forget it. Okay. So, so I did that at photo.net also for the same reason. I didn't want to get involved in um, support for people who had forgotten their password. I wanted it to be automated where they would get bounced to a page with the option to have the server email them their password. Um, who has an alternative point of view? Why is that bad? What's bad about that kind of system? Well, then if someone uses the same password they for everything, and the password becomes known to anybody who can access that database, or if it's oh. also sent over the internet publicly, it, it's going to be sent over the internet publicly no matter what. Well, you, even if you encrypt it in your database, if their password gets cracked on another site, mm -hmm. um, they'll still be able to log in on the Firecode site.
Um, well, again, if it's only for this site, then I don't think that's much of an issue because, um, you know, if somebody cracks the ser this server and gets their special password for this server, well, at that point, they also have access to anything that might be private on this machine. So what's the scenario where um, you can really mess somebody up? Let's say you have a site like photo.net where nothing, essentially nothing is private on photo.net. It doesn't really matter if the server gets cracked and somebody grabs the whole tables out. Who cares? Uh, what's the problem with that? If somebody cracks that, how can we, how can we be injuring the users? <coughs> what's the Yeah, I can mess up your reputation by logging into photo.net and in the printing out that, you know, Minox is the only correct camera to use and you get a lot higher quality than if you use a Hasselblad. Um, how else? Well, if it were something where you could really mess up somebody if they had access to a, a bank account or something, then the person could be at... But they, it's photo.net. They cracked the photo.net server, not the fleet bank but server. Ah. Yeah, so I think that um, I think that that's really now we're getting into the interesting area. So let's say they use the password foobar on photo.net. They also use that at the Fleet Bank site. Um, now they crack the photo.net server, and uh, the users really haven't. It's not been disclosed to them that you're not bothering to maintain high security on photo.net because nothing's confidential. They use their AOL password, which I guess gets them into a lot of money spending services on AOL. They use their Amazon password, which gets them into, you know, privacy, like all the books they're buying on, you know, survivalism. And um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, they may have their privacy and their finances compromised in pretty deep ways. It's sort of their fault in the sense that, oh, they're, they really should, you know, use randomly generated passwords on every site write them down and put them in a bank vault, but that's not how human beings behave. So I think that is the best reason for um, encrypting because if you get cracked, um, you're uh, less likely to injure other people. But it is a choice. Um, how does Amazon deal with this? Anybody know? What happens if you forget your Amazon password? Yeah, so Amazon is willing to, if you forget your password, they're not willing to mail it to you because um, they don't have it. It's encrypted, I guess, in their database. Um, but what they do is they reset it to some randomly generated string. They email you that string. So there's a moment in time where I guess somebody could intercept. Actually, no, they don't reset it to a randomly generated string. What they do is they email you a magic URL that contains some key. And basically, if you then, the first person to come back to the site uh, referencing that URL is then authorized to set the password for that account. So it, it authorizes you to come in into one page and one page only, reset your password, and uh, you're done. Um, so the only risk there is that somebody else could intercept the email in time, you know, before you did and get there first. But probably... They can deal with that because then if, if you know, if, uh, if uh, a cracker gets that email before you do and goes and sets your password on Amazon, then as soon as you follow the link, uh, Amazon denies you and says, hey, uh, this key has already been used. You know, if, uh, if it wasn't you who used it, call this 800 number and, you know, we can fix it up manually. So I think that's a pretty complete system. Again, it proves the general principle that all you have to do to do web design is look at how Amazon does things and copy them. Um, there's generally not much call for innovation uh, in this world. <laughs> yeah, it's sad but true. Um, all right, uh, so I think we've beaten the password subject to death. As an engineer, it's not really your job to impose one thing or another on people, but you should at least make the publisher aware. Here's the trade-offs. Here's the risks. Here's how Amazon does things. ACS for your information almost does the right Amazon type thing. Uh, you, can, you can set it in all kinds of different modes. The default, I believe, is that if you forget your password,
the server will reset it for you, and then you have to come back with that token. It's not quite as good as the Amazon thing because I believe it would, you know, it, it probably should instead give you a one-time use page like Amazon. Instead, it resets the password to some random string. You have to go and log back in using that random string that you would never want to use for your actual password. Then you have to find the you know change password page, and it's more cumbersome than Amazon. Uh, first name, what do you guys think of that? A column called first name and a column called last name. Yeah. <laughs> you guys buy into that? Yeah. So ACS says plural for first name to avoid the Yeah. Assume that all under. Well, so there's all these benighted people who don't live in the greatest country in the world, um, and some of them have you know, strange naming conventions for people. So I always thought that it was better to have first names and last name to deal with, you know, people who come from Argentina and have 17 names. Isn't um, the way around ours, isn't it first name and last names? Well, well, it depends, way. It depends where you are. It depends where you are, and, and then you let the user make the decision about which is which. But if you only give them first name and last name, I think that's a little bit um, English. That's what we call them in the table is not going to show up on the web page. No, it, well, that's a good, okay, that's a good excuse. So we call it that in the table, it's not going to show up on the page, but it does make the code harder to maintain. Um, anyway, okay, what about organization address and having the organization and the address in the table? What do you guys think? What's that? Is that the individual's address or the open address? It's the individual's. Well, it, well, we would be asking people for their business address. Yeah. I mean, what we care about when someone, when, the, when a public member logs in, we care that they are, they have some connection, yeah. that they have some reason to know about this stuff. They're a plumber. Tell us the address of your plumbing company. Right. If you if you think that for many users <laughs> they share one effective address, mm -hmm. then maybe you want to consider. Well, that saves a little disk space, but you know. Um, disks are getting bigger all the time. Here's a deeper issue. Uh, so what are you precluding? By having this as a free text field, what are you saying you're never going to be able to do? What query are you never going to be able to run with any assurance? Matches on a, on a specific organization name. What's that? Matches on a specific organization name. Well, you're, you're right. You're never going to be able to do a query like show me all the users who... Um, work for General Electric. Let's say GE is really into this stuff because of all their nuclear plant work and stuff. Right? Because some of them are going to type GE, some of them are going to type General Electric, some of them are going to type General Space Electric, some of them are going to type General Electric Company, some of them are going to you know, leave out a space or misspell something. So uh, you, when you're doing data modeling like this, you're, you're uh, implying a lot about what queries you're going to be able to do down the road. And maybe these guys don't care. Um, how would you deal with that when the user registers? When the user registers, um, you have to offer them a list of existing organizations that are already in a table. And you know, if you can't find your organization from this list, yeah, it was pretty cumbersome, and I'm not recommending it for um, a 6916 project. But I just want everybody to be aware that you know there's a choice implied here. Um, postal code, fine. Uh, you don't have a phone number in here. I wonder if these guys will be happy about that. Uh, yeah, probably should do that. Uh, okay, what do you guys think about this email column? And look carefully at the uh, extra crud associated with it. Or the lack of extra crud associated with it. I could be wrong, actually, but... No, you're right. What's interesting about email? That's not interesting about, um, you know, postal code 02139. Unique. Yeah, email. You you really. It's perfectly good. Perfectly good to have two users who are both from zip code 02139, but it begins to get a little bit questionable as to why you have two users with different user IDs and different names and different addresses who share an email address. Um, I guess there's some circumstances where you know three people could share an AOL account or something, um, but it's probably not something you actually want in your data model. And uh, I'm going to give you a side effect. Also, uh, there's a query. How many users have these guys got? 
seven thousand committee members, and then public is public. Okay, so anybody who's, you know, been burned. <laughs> anyway, so let's say they have, you know, thirty thousand users. Um, how long? How much work is a database going to have to do to find somebody who lives on Elm Street? Roughly. How would you describe the work the database has to do to find somebody who lives on Elm Street? What? Chug, chug through 30,000 records, right? So um, how about email address? How much work does the database have to do to find somebody at a given email address, which is probably a more common query? Like, find me the user whose email address begins with Joe or is Joe at hp.com. So it'd be the same. The observation is it's the same because there's no index on it. So I believe, in Oracle at least, if you constrain a column to be unique, the way that's implemented is it creates an index on that column. Um, and every time you try to insert a row, it checks the index to make sure the value is not already there. If you don't do that, then creating, um, then defining a column to unique has the unfortunate performance side effect of causing the database to have to do a sequential scan of all 30,000 rows or 100,000 rows or a million rows before it inserts uh, any new row to make sure that the unique constraint is, isn't being violated. So the database <laughs> will create a, what? Uh, maybe I just did set it unique. I don't know. Anyway. Um, let's f assume for the sake of argument that it's not unique because we don't see anything, yeah. any extra symbol associated with it. Is there a way to do it? Uh, I, suppose, I think I did it. I don't know. I'm not the unique. Cool. Uh, so no, email is unique and uh, is indexed. Oh. And if you close that, is it indicated anywhere or it not? It doesn't actually appear to. Oh, ah, okay. Well, all right. So I'm aligning these guys unfairly, but the principle is the same. Be aware that if you use... <laughs> I think Postgres might be one of the few databases, at least it used to work this way, Postgres is one of the few databases that will let you really ream yourself out. So it will let you define a column to be unique, and it will not create an index on that column, and it will not recommend that you index that column. So what's actually happening is that then, every, from, then you'll notice that your system runs slower and slower and slower, because every time you insert a row, it's having to sequentially scan the entire table to see whether that value is already in there. Um, like I said, in Oracle, they don't let you uh, screw yourself that way, and probably SQL Server is the same thing. I bet if the I bet the only way. Well, what did we see? Did we see that? Um, yeah, I think it's 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 creating an index, and then you can say it is unique on top of it. Yeah. So how does the index make it the search faster? Um, well, the index is a. I guess we could talk about that. Um, maybe we'll give a lecture of how it works under the hood. The index is a binary tree. Um, so I don't know if did you study? Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's a B tree index, and uh, you know every time you chase one link, you're throwing away half the database. So you get um, not instant search performance, but you get a search that time that grows as the logarithm of the number of records rather than the linear number of records. And there are um, I think there are hash indices. Uh, I guess there aren't hash indices and. There it does hash joins. I don't think you can actually create a hash table index. You can't get order one search performance, but you can get uh, order login. All right, um, opt out. I'm going to assume that's for uh, email. Um, and it defaults to false. false. Uh, what about reg date? What's that up to? So it defaults to getting the current date. Last visit. Um, excluded. Anybody have a problem with this excluded data with this way of excluding users? It's either or. Yeah, it's either. Okay. You say I really hate this guy, but I don't mind seeing him once a year. <laughs> That might be an interesting model. The idea was that we could say that if you excluded a user, it wasn't that they couldn't come to the site, it's just that they can't, change, they can't modify anything. They can't add a post, they can't. We're not going to lock them out, we're just going to say you can't change anything. Yeah. Uh, so, what problems do you see with this data model? Anybody have any ideas? 
let's say you, you've excluded the guy, he comes back to the site. He wants to know why. What happens? We need an audit trail, but you might well have it in another retailer. So no. You will. <laughs> of an action, who did it, why they did it, when they did it. Yeah, if you don't have who did it, why they did it, when they did it, then if you have a group of administrators um, working together on this site, you know, they're going to email one of them, and the guy will say, well, I don't know why you were excluded. You seem like a nice guy. He doesn't realize that one of the other administrators has found something that uh, you know, he didn't find. So if you don't have the audit trail, then you're, um, you need to use the database as a means of communicating amongst the people who are administering the site. I'm not saying, again, for you know, this uh, course that you should, you know, inherit your system to cover all possible cases. But again, be aware that uh, that's something to think about. I think that last visit is not going to work. I'm not sure if I can explain this to you adequately. Um, but it turns out that um, if you say every time the user grabs a page, here's the, here's the behavior. You put an AOL server filter um, on your web server, or are you, you do the same thing. Has anyone ever figured out how to do filters in IIS? Yeah. Okay. So you, what, are, what are they called? Uh, well, there are a couple different ways, but ISAPI would be a, a, a true, like, you write in C++. Okay. Do they call it filters there as well? What do they call it when you're writing ISAPI an ISAPI? filters, yeah. Okay. So you write an ISAPI filter, which is some gnarly C code that if you make a small mistake, will bring your entire machine uh, down. That's why AOL server is better. <laughs> Minor plugs. Also, record. <laughs> you can do that in DB. Yeah. All right, all right. So you do some kind of filter. Uh, it was not my idea. It was Hal's idea. Um, but uh, anyway. All right. Anyway, I'm just saying that it's something to think about. And uh, one way, I think the way ACS deals with it is they have a second to last visit and a last visit column. And uh, you don't push. You keep the last visit one fairly well updated so that you can always um, do things like ask who's in the chat room, who's been recent, really recently connected. But the second to last, you don't roll from last visit to second to last visit uh, unless it's been a long time. So you know when the user comes back to the site after a day, you push last visit and the second to last visit and the current uh, time until last visit. So it really is last login. Yeah, what that be. A, I'm not saying you should change your data model. As long as it's been thought about, I think you're in good shape. Um, all right, let's look at, uh, I'm not sure this really needs looking at. Um, one issue, if you're building commercial software like ACS, you basically need to have some mechanism for your, for your user group to take on extra properties. Now, in this case, they only have, it seems, one kind of user grouping that they want to do, like around which code. So in this case, they can just add columns here, you know, relating to uh, what kind of code it is, who's the primary maintainer. They can hard code that in. But be aware that, you know, anything that's an aggregation of users may want to uh, also own a lot more state. Uh, and that will involve extra columns or helper tables with extra columns, which is the way we did in ACS3. Okay, let's look at this uh, mapping table. Um, what can you guys say about this mapping table? What's interesting about it? <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Okay. If there's some people left, they expand to over 10,000 at once, so it's going to go up, right? Oh, the length is the number of bytes, which is an integer, which is composed. It's 32. Yeah. That, that's oh. a 32-bit number. Yeah. So Actually, the, the group ID number started a billion anyway. So. Yeah. Actually, that's another aside about Oracle. And Oracle, basically, any kind of number is represented with, um, is represented precisely up to about 40 decimal digits. So you can have quite long. So you can have them. Big number data type right. But in Oracle, you don't have a choice. It's not going to let you mess up. Um, but, uh, okay, so I, you do definitely need the user ID and the group ID. What other, what, what constraints might you want on this table? 
There's no unique column in the table, is there? Yes, there is. There is. There, there, no, yes, you're correct. There oh. is no unique column. Is that well, a problem? Or no? I, don't think there, I don't think there can be a unique column in this table. Why do you guys think? What would it mean for there to be one column to find unique? What's that? Or a group could only have one user, depending on which one you choose. Mm -hmm. um, the other but that, you're thinking along the right lines. Uh, but the, the other thing this doesn't show, which is hidden behind the GUI, is that there is a um, relationship between this back to the user in the group table. So that can we, oh, OK. Yeah, can we see any of that? Yeah. Look at this man. See, this is what I mean about this <laughs> GUI tool. right? If this were just a bunch of SQL code with all the constraints in a text file with some comments, I think it would be a lot easier to understand. So pers you know, here, you're going to have to go through hundreds of mouse. For a data model like ACS with 600 tables, you know, you'd have to go through thousands and thousands of mouse commands just to see uh, you know, what the constraints were. I guess that's why these tools, I mean, so people who program in this style, then they all have to go out and buy this tool called ERWIN, which draws graphical diagrams. And it just goes on and on and on, all because they didn't want to sit in Emacs and just type their SQL with a few comments here and there and the constraints here and there. So what have you got? So groups, um, group ID and groups has to be, the group ID and user groups has to be a group ID from groups, is what that says. Yeah, this is a very disturbing notation here it to is, me, primary key the, table. because the backwards this, of what you want it to be. Yeah. Well, I, I would just wouldn't use that term, right? Primary key table. You'd think that that meant the group ID was the primary key for this table, which it certainly is not. As we discussed, you want to have uh, a, a group wants to be able to have more than one user mapped into it. Foreign key table, I guess that makes sense. So you're specifying this. In Oracle, it would just be references. Uh, it's a foreign key relationship where you're saying that this column in the table uh, must point to something that is an actual in-use present key in the uh, user groups table. Um, there's also this cascading where uh, cascade delete. So you can set up your data model so that if you were to delete, uh, let's see, if you were to delete the user group, that that would cascade back to all the things that point to it. So if you deleted a user group, um, everything in the user group map table would disappear that points to it, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's the other way around, but yeah, the group table. If, if you delete something, free, if, if you delete the group from the group table, it disappears. Everything oh, from the user, user, group, user, user group maps, right. Sorry, I didn't understand your notation. Okay, actually, that gets into notation issue. I personally don't like this way of defining tables where um, I don't like case sensitivity, so I'll, and I'm not sure SQL Server would recognize it anyway. Um, so like capital U, capital G would be better, I guess, and it's say a C sharp program or something. Um, but I prefer to see underscores, so like user underscore groups. And actually, for a mapping table like this, which is a very common kind of table, I personally like to see table name one underscore table name two underscore map. So then it's clear that it, this table's function is to map from one table to another. It's easier to do an Oracle because you can have table names up to 38 characters not sure what the limit in SQL Server is. I think it's shorter. Uh, anyway, so think about that. You know, have maybe have some convention for this mapping table because it's very common. All right, so you have referential integrity constraints. What else you got? Uh, that, I think that's, so it's, it's on. It's on both. No index, no key. Uh, no, no index, no key. All right, so what's the implication of having no index, no key Next. on this table? First of all, how does it affect what you can represent? And how does it affect uh, your query performance? The query performance, it has to go through each one. Well yeah, if you want to show who's a member of uh, the uh, you know, fiberglass installation group, then you're going to have to sequentially scan a table that may have uh, probably a couple hundred thousand rows, because you know, maybe 10,000 users and 30 or 40 groups. So it could be. So it's sequentially scanning to, to tell you who's in the group. And the problem with that is that you know, that's not an administrative page. That's a query that you're doing um, anytime you're checking permissions. So let's say that group has a private area that only group members can visit. 
so every on every page load to check you know the connected users group membership you're sequentially scanning a couple hundred thousand row table and again you know if you want to ask yourself why Intel stock is doing so well I guess compared to maybe not compared to what they were doing a year ago but <laughs> compared to I don't know stock and well, I'm not going to put any personal companies <laughs> on the list. But anyway, they're doing quite well. Uh, and it's because of things like that. If you just make the tiniest little omission in your fancy GUI, you'll never know that that table doesn't have a key. It'll work just fine. It'll be a little pokey. And you'll say, my god, this Microsoft crap, it's so slow. It's going through all these layers. This .NET thing is really slow. Um, most people don't have adequate metering tools. Most people don't have the adequate experience. So they curse at Microsoft. Um, and the thing's grinding away. There are tools in the back end that you can get to find out which queries are taking up the most time, but most people don't know how to use them. Um, so that's uh, point one. Your application may run like a pig, particularly when checking whether somebody has permission to look at private group data. Um, what's a uh, second potential problem with not having a primary key constraint? Having to do with what you're actually storing. No. Well, first of all, you can't have a primary key constraint on two columns. You can say these two columns co constitute the primary key, I believe. You can certainly, I don't know, you can certainly do it in Oracle. And in SQL Server, uh, I know you can say these two columns together are unique, which is more or less the same thing, mm -hmm. except for the admission of nulls. Yeah. So, so what's the problem with not having any constraint on the pair of user ID and group? Yeah, so basically a user could be you know, really enthusiastic and keep hitting reload and like, I want to join, I want to join. So you end up having the user 30 times in the same group. Let's, let's see if there's, see, I, I do hate this application. This is definitely <laughs> one of the tools of the devo. Um, what, what, uh, I want to see the right click on it. Right click here? Yeah, the indexes and keys are down there. Oh. But you just set that as a primary key, so yeah. Um, where was the index? Uh, oh yeah, index is keys. Yeah. Into CC, they can't even spell at Microsoft. Let's beat up on, it's, it's going to be national beat up on Microsoft day. Um, relationships. So you can put both of the, you can put the user ID and the group ID in there. Uh, yeah. And now what? Oh, index file, well, that's yeah. primary, but that's not the same thing. It, well, unique is the checkbox below it. Yeah, so you could do that. Like I said, this is a little bit different from primary key because I, so this, this is the kind of thing that I think Oracle does do better. I think the differences are it's considered very untasteful and maybe in fact is impossible to have a foreign key constraint uh, that doesn't map to a primary key. So basically in Oracle, you can say, you can have a compound primary key of user ID and group ID. You won't need to have you know, some generated map ID in addition. And then you can point to that from another table and have the integrity constraint being enforced. Um, and so having just a unique constraint probably won't let you do uh, a referential integrity constraint from another table. And it will also allow you to have uh, garbage in there like uh, nulls. So I guess you then have to also constrain them. Well, I guess they already are constrained to disallow nulls. So I guess if each column is constrained not null and they're both unique, and uh, the pair, and it's specified pairwise unique, I guess that probably is functionally the same as a primary key. But let's also talk about, is that enough? So let's say I create, um, can you go back to that? Sorry. Okay. Have, so now we have a, an, now we have a unique index on user ID and group ID as a pair, um, we've solved our, I think if, there, if, there, if we disallow nulls, we've solved our data representation problem. We're not going to have a user in the same group four times. Have we solved our query performance problem? Yes, no, or maybe? Yeah, I don't actually know what this does. <laughs> well, let's assume it indexes. 
Maybe. <laughs> depending on depending on your query. Are you asking for users for a given user? What groups are they in? Or asking for a group what users are in? And how does the yeah. So why don't you explain it to folks? So what what do you what do you think is going to be made fast by this? Okay, so what kind of query can we answer quickly? I'm a user. What groups do I belong to? Yeah, so this makes the page where the user logs in, um, and you know maybe on uh, you know her personal workspace, you see she sees uh, all the groups that she belongs to. Um, that makes that query fast, but the query of you know I'm a page that's private to group number 432. Uh, that query still requires a sequential scan. Because the, the way these concatenated index indices are work, I guess the stuff is just mushed together and build a B tree based on that. So basically, you need a second index um, based on... Uh, just user ID, just group ID. Can you only... Oh, I, I guess and you, can create a, yeah, you can create a new one. So this is truly horrible. And there's no comments. So when I do a data model and I create an index, I always put a comment in right up above saying, you know, this is to make the query, and then, you know, which I don't spell it out in SQL, but I spell it out in English at least, you know, does a user belong to a, group, a particular group fast? Um, so I think, like I said, I just can't say enough. Maybe I can say enough bad things about this style of developing SQL, but so the hack in this case I haven't. To I haven't yet. <laughs> what? So in this case, the workaround is to create two identical tables where one is the primary key and one, and one is no, no, no. Two well, indices on the same table. Two, two indices on the same table. Yeah. So there are limits. I think Oracle lets you only define 16 indices on one table, but usually that's more than enough. So now there's an index. There are three indexes on this table. Which we, I don't even. This may be overkill. I don't know enough about the SQL Server, but so there's a there's one for the two of them together, and then one for each of the columns individually. Okay. So, what do you guys think about that? Um, we have one on user ID. Can you bring up? Mm -hmm. Sorry, one on user ID also. Maybe it's necessary. So, can the index on one column substitute for the other? I don't think so because it's less specific. Uh, however, I can tell you that at least Oracle, and I'm pretty sure SQL Server also, um, let's say this is an index on three columns, and you're only doing a query where you're looking for the first two, it can still use that index. Um, if you're only looking for user ID, again, it can still use that index, because it really does build the index first by one column, and then uh, sub-branches off of the other ones. So uh, basically, you should not need, if you have concatenated indices, which is what they're called in the Oracle world at least, um, you don't need indices um, on shorter combinations of uh, columns. As long as it's in the same order, you're not doing anything except chewing up disk space and you're slowing down your transactions. Because remember, for every index, every time you insert a row or update a row, you're having to update uh, all n of your indices, which is, I guess, one reason why having a limitation on six, of 16 isn't so bad. Uh, that's also why our database servers tend to have so many disk drives. Because if you think about it, if you put your main table on disk drive one, and your first index on disk drive two, and you know so forth, so 16 indices, 17 disk drives, um, you are actually able to process a transaction as fast as if you didn't have to update more than one in one place. Because you can do the updates on all 17 disk drives at the same time. But uh, all right. Um, so let's. Uh, I guess let's look at your user experience. Let's log into this fine quality site. Um, so it redirects any page to the login page. So okay. you can bookmark into the site, and it will pop you here first. All right. What do you guys think? UI. Everybody likes it? No improvements at all? I like this. Personal, take personal responsibility for your work. It's even better who it points to. <laughs> Not me. That's beautiful. Well, there's, there's nothing. Uh, this is just pure functionality. There's nothing here that tells what this is about or who they are. 
Yeah, although presumably uh, this is the seed and this could be a sub box within the home page or a link from the home page. So what about this? What do we in the light of stuff we talked about yesterday, any ideas for making this different, better, worse? Okay, so we can move it a bit. What else? What about this login button? Where should that be? Underneath the boxes. Okay, so one idea is put it underneath the boxes. Any other ideas? There? Yeah, so I, I don't know. Personally, I think here or here might be better than here. Um, those are small differences, but again, if they can't find the login button, they'll find this button. Um, Perhaps you type your username and your password, you have to go and grab your mouse in order to point to the login button and click hit enter. Most browsers you just hit enter. Okay. You can't hit enter actually. I think you'd have to hit tab. But it's only if you have a one it's only if you have a one field form that you can usually hit enter. I don't know what it does. And this is also yeah, enter works here. Okay. Maybe it was smart enough to figure out that the form was completely filled out. Um Okay, uh, what about um, this language, click here to register? Any thoughts? Yeah, so Tim Berners-Lee, uh, when the web was new, created this massive assault on the words click here <laughs> or click. He thought that was basically bad, that if you had an interface where you had to tell people um, to do that, that it was bad. I'm not sure. Um, it might motivate people to action more. It does. If you just had the word register, people might understand less. But it certainly is a warning sign if you're using the words click here that maybe there is something wrong. Uh, one approach actually might be to turn that into a button, to actually turn that into a no value post, um, because then uh, the browser will render that as a button, and that can be more actionable. And if you had a graphic designer, now the graphic designers, of course, they don't like these buttons. The first thing a designer does when getting hold of a web service is they say, look, the way, the, the way browsers typically render these submit buttons is horrible, and I'm going to give you a bunch of little GIFs. So basically, at this point, you'd have you know, a login, an attractive login GIF here. Uh, so, you know, there's some syntax in HTML to replace the uh, submit button with a graphic, and then there'd be like a big flashing register thing here, and everybody would be happy. So, all right, what about the uh, user experience here? We typed the wrong thing. Good, bad? So one thing that I used to do, and I think this is probably the wrong thing now, but I like the idea of having the user type uh, email address on page one, and then page two figured out, oh, is this an existing user? If so, serve a password query page. If it's not, serve a register page. Now, of course, when people made a typo in entering their email address, that had the negative effect of offering them the opportunity to register anew. Um, but at least that gets around this problem. I kind of like forms that work this way, where you get the form back with all your data and um, you know, stars or red things near uh, what you typed. I think that's kind of a nice way to do things. Does uh, .NET sort of support that? It's actually the default. And what it actually will do, that's, it will use, um, if you have a browser that supports dynamic HTML, it will do validation on the browser. So right. it'll do, before you hit submit, it will validate the form as much as it can. Um, so the only thing I don't like about this, personally, is that uh, these are invalid and it doesn't give you any help text. Like, what do you do next? So let's say, you know, if you keep getting thrown back here a hundred times, you're going to be pretty frustrated. And I guess you'll just send mail to webmaster if there is some mechanism for resetting the password in the database or for emailing it to you. It, it really needs to be a link from that red... Uh, Did that check the database to see if it was invalid? Not just a database. <laughs> the world's best database with the fanciest GUI. Imaginable. 
there's only two inches. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We're not talking rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> and the well, machine's not too heavily loaded, I <laughs> don't imagine. Yeah. Well, 128 megs of RAM is always heavily loaded, but yeah. All right, have you got anything else to show? Uh, well, Can you log, log in? log in, yeah. So if you log in as the sort of administrator account, now, you didn't have to think when you did all your session stuff, right? Because you're just using yep. sort of Microsoft APIs, right? Yep. What about for authentication? Yep. Same deal? So you're using their session API, and you have no idea whether it encrypts the password or some kind of off key. Does it expire after a while? Uh, you can set it. You, you can right. set, you, you either, if, if you have one machine that's doing it, um, so it's figured out. My last login was today. Mm -hmm. Um, I have administrator access, and I could go. Is there anything here, Chris? But there's that. It might even throw an error. Okay. Oh yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what a dotted error looks like. Now this is kind of a nice feature. I assume you've turned it on to do this, and yeah. right. So this is something you can also set an AOL server if you go into the config file. You can set your web server. I don't know if your TAs have showed you. Uh, you give it a list of IP addresses, and to those IP addresses, it will serve a stack backtrace instead of the generic error message, thus saving you a trip to the error log. Uh, so let's go back. Uh, what do you guys think of this workspace page? <laughs> Any comments? <laughs> good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Any comments? Good or bad? Hey, you, hey you've got a, we've got a cartoon mascot. Animated flames. <laughs> so I think this is kind of a good page in a way because if you have uh, special privileges or special group memberships, then you get links to pages to take action for those things, you know, right after you log in. If you log in as public, you don't get that. So anyway, this looks to me like a pretty well-conceived system. If you're running behind schedule, you know, you might want to talk to these guys and steal some of their code. Um, that's part of being a good developer. Can you just change that e-committee for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, que any, any, any questions? Uh, otherwise, we'll... We'll pack up. Um, well, this is a lab course, so basically, you know, code review, code review, code review. I think almost, I don't know if you guys are bored out of your skulls any more than you were when I was trying to teach general principles, um, but personally, I think that anything interesting that could happen is going to happen on somebody's project you know, within somebody's work. So we've seen, you know, um, like yesterday, right, we saw the good and the bad ways of doing, uh, sending SQL queries, the safe and unsafe ways, I should say, of sending SQL queries to a database with bind variables and without. Um, so yeah, I think code review, unless you guys are saying, you know, I hate this, we'll do more code review. What's going on on Friday? Friday, um, you get a day off to program. Um, for at least the morning. We'll probably still do some, we have to do some code review every day. Um, on Friday, um, I'm teaching this little photo.net seminar in this room to, I guess, a few people. But again, this is really not a lecture course. It's, you know, the learning happens, you know, at your terminal. The learning happens when you steal code from these guys and try to get it to work. Um, it happens when you try to figure out, you know, how many indices they have and how to extract that information from the Microsoft GUI. <laughs> Should we come on Friday to this, or is this, are we good the format? Come on Friday? Should we? If, you, if you're done with, you know, everything, <laughs> then don't bother coming. We do, are we, have we heard it before, what you're going to say? In oh, to the photo.net thing. Yeah, if you came to my one, yeah, you've heard it before. It's my one, I might have a slightly extra spin on photography. There's some guys from Kodak and stuff here, but it's basically the same old spiel. Most people only know one or two things. I'm no exception. <laughs> so I just keep talking online communities, online communities, online learning communities. So do we show on and on and on. SQL code, tickle code. What? Do we show up at 9.30 tomorrow morning? No. No, don't bother. But tomorrow's not Friday, tomorrow's Thursday. Yeah, I know, but just, is tomorrow Thursday? Yeah. yeah. No, just show up and, you know, be in the lab. And when there's breaks, I'll come over and hang with you guys and see how people are doing. <laughs>